The Land Rover Discovery Sport has been around for a little while, however the plug-in hybrid variant, the P300e, has only been around since 2020. And in this review we're going to be seeing if it's worth its price tag, because in the UK it can be found from roughly £48,000. So to kick things off we're going to talk about its exterior design, and here subjectively I think it looks good, at least for an off-roader. For me the front design is very much Land Rover Discovery-esque, and the same could be said about its rear profile. It's definitely a larger vehicle in comparison to the likes of, let's say, the Range Rover Evoque. As for the side profile, I do like the fact that the manufacturer has integrated body coloured wheel arches and side skirts. And as for the rims, we've got the 18 inch alloys, although 20 inch alloys will come as standard in the Urban Edition or indeed the R Dynamic SE. Now, it's also worth bearing in mind in terms of the paint options, we've got a black coloured roof which doesn't come as standard, so therefore it's an additional option. And as for the actual colour of the vehicle, it's also a £705 option if you want the metallic finish. Premium metallic finishes will come in at around £970. As standard, it comes in a solid white finish instead. Now, its interior design is also similarly impressive, and here Land Rover should be commended for the use of materials around the cabin, at least around the dashboard, around the steering wheel, even in terms of the door finishes. And there's also use of plastic as well, although I can see the point of this, specifically if you have, let's say, wet fingers or you're coming in from a muddy trek. But on the flip side, in terms of practicality, I feel that the manufacturing has kind of got lost in two worlds. For example, you've got a 10-inch infotainment system which is plenty responsive and fluid and supports Android Auto and Apple CarPlay in a wired format only, so not wireless, at least not at the time of filming. But then under it, you have got a set of capacitive touch buttons and also physical buttons, which just kind of doesn't make sense. I just feel that the use of physical buttons, specifically given the Discovery Sport, might be used when you're out and about and you have wet fingers or let's say muddy hands or whatever, would have potentially been appreciated to have physical buttons instead. So here if you want to adjust let's say the climate controls you have to touch on a button and then access another setting or indeed if you want to let's say access certain other settings so for example the drive mode or the fan settings here you do have a physical button and then you can use the physical knobs instead so it just feels like they've kind of got lost in two worlds and the same could be said of actually about the window adjustments they're placed above over here where my hand is it just it just doesn't seem right at least in my opinion it should be further down or potentially placed towards the center console but i know it's a very small point but something i thought i should highlight now as for the buttons around the steering wheel there's no issues whatsoever i also do like how they kind of dynamically changed depending on what settings you're adjusting. So for example, on settings in terms of media versus your instrument cluster. And just behind the steering wheel, you've got two reason reasonably placed stalks and also fappy paddles, which we'll touch upon in terms of its eight-speed transmission. Now, as for the instrument cluster, here again, it just feels a little bit of a mixed bag. At least in its stock configuration, you've got a part analog, part digital display. And here it just means that the two don't really blend well together. At least again, not in my opinion. You might want to go for the fully digital display instead which might come as standard in the more expensive trims but here it's going to be an additional option on top of your extra bill as for the head-up display this is again another additional option which comes in around 500 pounds which is reasonable to ask for in my opinion and bolster the overall safety credentials of the vehicle so this might something that you might want to consider to add in terms of your overall spec on the discovery sport now speaking of options if you're into audio you might want to consider the meridian sound system or the meridian surround system system over the stock six speaker 180 watt configuration and the reason behind this is because the stock sound system is pretty poor at least in my opinion for a vehicle that costs of roughly fifty thousand pounds in fact if you want a dedicated audio review do check it up on your pop banner down the description below or indeed in the pinned comments so moving swiftly on we have to talk about storage capacity within the cabin and here i do like that the land rover discovery feels just a little bit more spacious in comparison to let's say the range rover evoke which just feels well a little bit more compact now here in the Discovery Sport you've got a place to stow away your smartphone just by the front of the center console. You've also got a USB Type-C input for charging. Further down you have got a set of cup holders and then you've got a kind of non-slip bay which comes in included as well. And then as for the center armrest it's large enough for let's say a small size purse or makeup bag and also a wallet but it's not going to be that large to fit all those type of valuables that you might want or for example in comparison to some of its alternatives. 
On the plus side, you have got two USB inputs. In here, you've got a Type-C and a Type-A input, and then you've got a 12-volt socket. Another 12-volt socket can be found at the rear of the center console, and that's for your rear occupants to provide some extra power. Elsewhere, as for the door bins, you've got plenty of space within the front door bins and a little bit more limited towards the rear door bins. And the only bugbear that I've got over here is that the front door bins are not really well designed for you to place a 500 milliliter bottle. Yes, it will fit over here, but in terms of how it fits, it's just not as intuitive as some of its competitors. Now, when it comes to storage, we have to talk about boot capacity. And here, it's a electronically operated tailgate, which comes as standard in all the plug-in hybrid trims. Now, here, there's a button found within the cabin, a button found on your remote, and a button found just above the number plate. Now, when the boot does open, I do find its hatchback design isn't as, well, tall as I wanted it to be. I'm just under six foot, and I feel that I kind of have to just hunch down a little bit when I'm taking in and out goods, or else I'm going to be slamming my forehead on top of the boot. Now, if you're going to be taller than me, then you're going to, of course, find this a problem. Or, of course, if you're shorter than me, then it might be a non-issue. Now, what I must say objectively, however, is the fact that the boot capacity that you get is absolutely class leading. You've got 1,179 litres to play around with. And that's also thanks to the fact that you've got a really large underfloor compartment storage. And if you were to pop down the seats, you've got 1,794 litres instead. Frankly, over here, I don't think you're going to have any problems whatsoever when it comes to transport goods. Furthermore, I like the fact that Land Rover have incorporated a 40-20-40 split and therefore means that you can drop the middle seat and take elongated goods while still transporting two rear occupants. And here, if you're going to be dropping the seats quite regularly, the only thing to be mindful about and something to note is that the middle seat is manually operated while the two main seats are electronically operated and that's found through a set of buttons found towards the rear of the boot. So what about when it comes to comfort? So now here, in terms of headroom and legroom, the Discovery Split Sport again stands out in comparison to a lot of its competitors, specifically for example even the Range Rover Evoque which is a lot more compact. Again, as someone who's just under six foot, I've got no issues whatsoever when it comes to headroom and similarly when it comes to legroom. I think even if you were six foot seven you would comfortably fit at the rear of the vehicle. Now if you were an owner and you were six foot seven as well, you'll comfortably fit at the front of the vehicle as well. You've got 12-way electronically adjustable seats and they're also heated as well which adds to the overall comfort. Now as for for the seats themselves in terms of the firmness, they're a little bit more on the firm side, so specifically the ones which are found towards the rear of the cabin, and the middle one is unsurprisingly a little bit more stiffer as well. Now, if you're not gonna be using the rear middle seat and therefore you're only having two rear occupants, then you can bring down this compartment and therefore you've got a armrest which reveals two cup holders and also a storage bay. Now, I should also mention in terms of convenience that if you want rear climate controls, you're gonna have to spend 205 pounds. If you want keyless entry, Entry, it's 420 pounds and if you want a cabin purifier system it's going to come in at 335 pounds all of these options i should have expected to be coming as standard but alas that's not the case in the discovery sport similarly as it was not the case in the range rover evoke either now what does come as standard however are front and rear parking sensors and a rear view camera although one might expect this at this price point now you can further bolster the experience by adding a 585 pound option and here you get surround cameras so it gives you a little bit of peace of mind when you're doing certain maneuvers. Now this perfectly leads me on to visibility whereby the Discovery Sport is fantastic. Both at the front and the sides of the vehicle there's no problem whatsoever and given the pretty large window at the back as well it means it's quite easy to just look over your shoulder and check your surroundings if you don't want to use the rear view camera for example. So with visibility out the way we're just going to check our surroundings and get going and talk about the driving comfort. Now first off I do want to talk about the suspension setup and here here, the Discovery Sport has got a quite soft suspension setup, which does play a part when you're going on any city commute and you're going over speed bumps or potholes. And combined with the fact that we've got the 18-inch alloys here, it means that, well, you don't really feel the road too much under you, which is exactly what you might expect. Furthermore, if you're going to be going off-roading, this is exactly what you want. You don't want something that's quite stiff and it's got a little bit of ground clearance as well to bolster that experience. 
Now, the flip side of this is that if you're going to be going on more spirited drives around country roads, the vehicle does suffer from quite substantial amounts of body roll. And in comparison to its sibling, the, the Range Rover Evoque, here the Range Rover Evoque has a much more well stiffened approach and therefore means that you can well throw the car a little bit more when you're going around corners. Now, similarly, the Discovery Sport doesn't quite have that great driver's feel, whereby the steering input feels all that bit numb. And even when it comes to the accelerator pedal no matter if you're on the more dynamic mode or if you're going on the comfort setting it just feels a little bit mushy yet again i'm not too surprised here given the class of the vehicle although one should say that due to the naming it might confuse people and think that this vehicle is quite a sporty suv but that's not quite the case and specifically when you compare it to some of its competitors say for example from the likes of volvo or bmw here these rival manufacturers offer a little bit more of a sporty flair and indeed a vehicle that will give you a better driver's input however where the discovery sport stands out in comparison to its competitors is in terms of its off-road capabilities indeed through the center console you can adjust through the different modes in other words you can go through gravel snow mud or for example sand mode and of course you can let the vehicle decide for itself in terms of what terrain it's going on furthermore you've got low traction mode hill start assist and also gives you low traction mode when you're going down hills as well all of which just bolsters the overall experience furthermore you've got 600 millimeters of wading capability and in terms of payloads that you can take on top of your roof it's 75 kilograms and in terms of towing capacity you've got 750 kilograms of unbrake trailer capacities and 1600 kilograms if you're going to be going with a brake trailer you can also go for tow assist which is an additional option and thereby gives you a little bit of extra capabilities and functionalities when it comes to taking a trailer you will also have to purchase a tow bar be it electronic or not if you so wish in other words if you're going to be taking something on the rear of the vehicle ultimately what i'm trying to say over here is that it is a land rover after all and as such its off-road capabilities are a definite plus point for those people who are going to be utilizing them now with all of that in mind i should also point out that when it comes to driving off-road you do have an all-wheel drive system at your disposal however this will not operate on an all-electric all-wheel drive system here instead if you're going to be going on pure ev mode you're going to be relying on a rear wheel drive setup only which is slightly different from the larger more expensive Range Rovers or Land Rovers out there on the market this is very much the similar case that could be said about the Evoque and it's just something I thought to point out in a Discovery Sport now having just referenced the engine let's talk about raw performance and here the Discovery Sport has a 1.5 litre three-cylinder engine which outputs 197 horsepower but when combined with its 80 kilowatt motor which is planted on the rear axle this takes it up to 309 horsepower and it dispatches 540 newton meters of torque i had it tested from 0 to 60 miles an hour in 6.83 seconds which should definitely be nippy enough for a lot of individuals although isn't as fast as fully electric suvs in its segment which can go from 0 to 60 in roughly four to five seconds now in terms of top speed you've got 130 miles an hour which again should be plentiful for most consumers although german viewers and all or those who drive in unrestricted roads might want a little bit faster now what is ridiculously quick however is this eight speed transmission and here you can go through the gears quite literally without feeling them at all be it automatically be it in drive or sport mode when you shift left on the gear selector or be it if you're going manually through the gears be it through the gear selector when you're in sport mode and or through the flappy paddles found behind the steering wheel Land Rover have absolutely nailed the execution over here and it gives you an absolutely fantastic experience now the same could be said about switching between ev mode and petrol mode it does it intelligently enough and whereby you do not hear and or feel the difference although i should say you can hear the 1.5 liter engine trickling away at the front of the vehicle but other than that you won't be aware as to which mode it's running on other than if you do glance down at your instrument cluster and see where the needle is pointing in other words if it's in ev mode and or in petrol mode now this does bring me on to its electric range and here unfortunately the discovery sport does disappoint i netted roughly 20 to 25 miles in pure ev mode and of course i appreciate it depends as to how you drive and where you drive but by comparison the range rover evoke did a slightly better job at getting around 25 to 30 miles 
And so what about when it comes to fuel efficiency? Now from its 57 litre fuel tank, I netted 30 to 35 miles per gallon, which yet again isn't a great figure to achieve for a vehicle of its class and or of its price. But one of its fortes, at least when it comes to its electric range, is the fact that Land Rover have incorporated a 32 kilowatt input via its CCS port. And this means you can go from zero to 80% in just around 30 minutes. Should you go for the type two input and therefore a seven kilowatt input instead, you'll go from zero to 80% in roughly one hour and 20 minutes go for a three pin input, in other words, via a wall socket, it will take from zero to 100% in around six hours and 40 minutes. Suffice to say here, when it comes to the plug-in hybrid market, Land Rover should be commended for integrating a more rapid and or a faster means of charging the vehicle. So therefore you can be at home and or at work and get that electric portion topped up as much as possible. And finally, we get on to safety and the driver assistance systems and touching upon the former first, it scored five out of five stars on Euro NCAP's rigorous crash test back in 2014. Although if you do look at the rating, it's no longer valid in 2021. And I should also raise the question of how it scored five stars when it comes to its side pole test where the vehicle absolutely concaves in. Suffice to say, it's not built like a brick like the Land Rover Defender. Nevertheless, I can't really comment all that much about Euro NCAP's crash test and or rating, but I can talk about the driver assistance system whereby the vehicle has cruise control and lane departure warning uh, and traffic sign recognition system all built as standard. And if you want to bolster the experience, you can go for the R Dynamic SC and or go for a pack which gives you the likes of adaptive cruise control which does work on and off although I do feel that it doesn't regulate your speed and or distance all that well from the vehicle in front of you but then on the plus side the likes of rear cross traffic light and blind spot monitoring system do work absolutely phenomenally well and so does the auto high beam assist. And so this brings me on to my verdict of the P300e. Now frankly from its exterior design I do like it at least for an off-roader. As for its interior aesthetics it's definitely pleasing to the eye although in terms of practicality Land Rover could have improved on certain points. However when it comes to boot capacity and in terms of the rear occupant space I think it's class leading. But the thing where it really falls short on is in terms of fuel efficiency and in terms of electric range. And combine this with the pretty high asking price of around 50,000 pounds for the plug-in hybrid variant, it makes you think that you can get either fully electric vehicles instead or indeed plug-in hybrid alternatives from rival manufacturers. But of course, that's just our opinion about the P300e. We'd be intrigued to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. And of course, if you like this video or want to see more, definitely do like and subscribe and hit that bell notification, all of which would be greatly appreciated. As such, I've been Chris from Totally EV, and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.